CPG Innovation Insights for Growth. And we have, a, we have a great moderator. And Melissa, as the moderator, I'll make sure you get those extra minutes at the end. I have to just share some of your background because, you know, I know you, but, but I forget all the stuff you've done. Another corporate entrepreneur and a traditional entrepreneur. But, you know, you what, a, a senior VP at Starkist, executive at Residence at, at Chatham, you know, the Woman Entrepreneurial Center, which I, which I thought was a really interesting, uh, you know, uh, helping really catalyze, you know, females in, in technology and females in entrepreneurship. Yeah, adjunct professor at CMU in, in, in marketing. And of course, president of Melissa Murphy Marketing. So let me throw it over to you and, and have some fun. That's great. Thank you so much, Lou. I've really enjoyed the speakers today and uh, hope that we can deliver as we wrap up the day today. I'm really excited to have some folks uh, with me today that I won't say years because that would date all of us, but a lot of us grew up together in our careers and I'm excited to have them um, join us today to not only talk about their current experiences, but also how we've seen this world of innovation develop and change, specifically in CPG, but also um, in other categories that they've worked in. So what I'd like to start off with is just asking each of the speakers to give a quick introduction of themselves. Ryan, if you can go first, and then Nate, and then Kelly, that would be fantastic. Sure. Thank you, Melissa. And uh, welcome to everyone. Thanks for having us today. Really appreciate the opportunity. My name is Ryan Thomas. Uh, I currently lead marketing of our the pet business at the JM Smucker Company. I hate to admit it, but I have 20 years in the FMCG industry. And that goes back. Uh, Heinz, uh, Campbell Soup also did a stint in private equity and, and now the JM Smucker Company. Sorry, can't help but smile seeing Ryan on the camera there. I have been and you, Melissa. Man, that goes way back. Uh, <laughs> we all, we all started. Our, we all started together. Yeah, a long time ago. I won't use years. Nate, while you're up, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, and then we'll have Kelly go. Yeah. So Nate Paris, personally, you know, four dogs. Actually, wait, four kids, three dogs, two cats, one wife. A lot of a uh, lot of work history. I started. With, uh, with Heinz and Domani in the CPG space. Went out, moved to Seattle, worked for Starbucks for a bit, uh, worked for Amazon, digital space. Went over to um, you know, the CPG vendor space with Giant Eagle. And now um, working with my wife, trying to scale her business. She's a super talented interior designer. I wanna see how far it can go. Awesome, yeah, she is a super designer. Kelly? Melissa, so <laughs> See you. Um, thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to be here on this panel. I'm Kelly Scalota, and I am the CEO and founder of KS Consulting and Capital, where I do marketing consulting and angel investing. Melissa and I did grow up together in the agency business at Ketchum and worked for many years on CPG accounts. I ended up being a partner at Ketchum in charge of the global brand marketing practice and left there four years ago to go out on my own. And now I'm doing amazing marketing consulting work, a lot of it in the um, innovation space for large national organizations, for high potential startups. And I'm also a very active investor, uh, angel investor, and also getting involved with some uh, VC investing. Uh, mostly focused on female-founded uh, uh, businesses. I'm part of the Next Act Fund here in Pittsburgh, which is um, focused on women, female-led companies. And I'm also part of Portfolio, which is a VC group on the West Coast um, that invests in lots of later stage deals. I just have to mention that I am a published author. First book was on marketing to women, but my second book, very different and personal, I just launched last night. It is about over overcoming cancer. Let's see if I can get it in here. And uh, so I've had a really big week, so I'm excited to be here. Well, thanks to all of you. I have to say on a personal level, it's just fantastic to see all of your faces and to be able to reconnect, but also to hear about the journey we've all taken and where we've started and all the things that we've learned and grown along the way and how we've all sort of, you know, stayed in touch, but gone in different paths as well. So that's just, this is just fun for me. So thank you for doing all of this. Let's first start off just talking about innovation in general and what one of the things that I think if you've heard some of the previous speakers today was that 
you know, some of the best people in innovation really have diverse backgrounds. Um, they're not, they don't have tunnel vision of healthcare or tech. Um, they're really looking at all categories, understanding the strengths and weaknesses of those and learning from those. So I know we all come from a CPG background, but I also know that we've all been in a lot of other categories as well. So I'd like to just start off with a basic understanding of your thoughts of strengths of CPG innovation and some of the similarities with some of the other fields. Ryan, why don't we start with you and go from there? Sure, I'll, I'll attempt to kick it off. You know, your observation around some of the best leaders have diverse backgrounds and experience, I, I certainly agree with that. You know, I often talk about the best innovators are just the best dot connectors. And the dots can connect across industries, they can uh, across consumers, across sectors, but this idea of dot connecting and, and uh, is really important. And so having an understanding, a, a deep, rich understanding of one category and being able to apply uh, principles uh, to other categories or other sectors uh, is, is really important. I'll kick off the conversation on your second question and, and then turn it over. You know, I, CPG, really was the foundation of, of marketing, right? We, we talk about when marketing was, was really created as a science. Certainly branding has been around for, for hundreds of years, but marketing as a science, and it really took foothold in, in the CPG space and, and consumer demands, particularly in, in the United States. I think the strength of the CPG is uh, its understanding of consumer, how to understand consumer, how to understand consumer behavior, and, and how to understand how to influence consumer behavior. And, and that's really the art and the science, right? The science side of how behavior is created uh, and how it can be um, challenged, how it can be curated. And then the creative side is how you bring that to life in, in a current zeitgeist, in a current, current environment. Um, so. Good. Kelly, do you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. I'll offer uh, two kind of areas of thoughts here. One, I'm working with Mary Beth Green at the incubator that's powered by Sheets. She's their chief um, innovation officer there. And she talks about T-shaped people that she's looking for um, as innovators, people who have kind of a horizontal knowledge of innovation process, design thinking, and also talking to humans. Um, and then kind of a deep dive in something that's either technical or food or workforce or you know, some specific area of innovation. And by the way, um, I was talking to her before this call. This is a shameless plug. She is looking for innovation manager. So if there's anyone who's listening to this who wants a job, Mary Beth Green on LinkedIn. So I think that's an interesting way to think about the type of person. I will also say in the CPG space, I see still um, solutions in search of a problem versus really addressing a very serious unmet need in the marketplace. And so as an investor, I've had... I've screened over 300 companies in the past five years, not all of them CPG, but a healthy dose of them. And um, a lot of times there is still an unanswered question in the CPG uh, pitches around, you know, is this really a market need? So I think you really have to think long and hard about, is it a market need and are you solving it in a different way? Because that really is the crux of um, where the, you know, the business model is and where you'll get traction. And in CPG, I think it's harder than in a lot of other places, you know, and trying to get marketplace traction with consumers is a tall order. I'm part of the Angel Capital Association. When they do analysis around uh, which types of companies have the best exits, CPG is typically at the bottom of the list because it's just so hard to get that marketplace traction. So I think um, while it's an area that I'm particularly interested in, I grew up in CPG, I also think it's one of the toughest areas um, for innovation. Nate, you want to chime in? Yeah, I think I'd agree with both of them. It's, uh, for me, as soon as you asked that question and Ryan hit it, uh, you know, I said, Kelly, you know, it's consumer research. It's understanding. And it is rigorous and it is hard because you're fighting for 10 feet of shelf that you have to kick someone out for and, and justify and make that story. Right. And there's a, you know, it's an 18 month window, 16 month. I don't know if it's shrunk you know, recently, but I mean, uh, you know, from start to, you know, getting on shelf, that's insane. And, and the amount of rigor uh, that has to go into that is, is crazy as well, whether it's, you know, talking directly to a customer, uh, you know, going to your own, talking to the vendors, uh, you know, what is your customer want? How can we make the special for you? I mean, it's all kinds of considerations and you got to make the sales, right? 
versus, you know, something like a, a GE, you can be a fast follower. And if you've got the real estate, uh, you're an innovator. Um, you know, Amazon, it was funny, they talked about, you know, consumer research, but uh, they, they understood the consumer from the moment that that customer touched the site, right? They weren't doing customer research and understanding the customer and how they got there and some of those stuff. All that has to be done within CPG to prove the story. Yep, absolutely. One of the interesting things that um, was mentioned in some of the other sessions was related to that customer discovery. And I couldn't help smile a little bit when they started talking about it and almost making it sound sort of new or novelty. And I'm like, that's, that's what a lot of CPG has been built on. So I'm just wondering, if Sean were on here, I'd ask him to chime in on this, because one of the things that he's always been most interested in, Ryan, when you actually spoke the last time, is understanding that rigor of customer discovery. And what amazed him the most was not only the quantity of discovery work that was done, but also the depth of the discovery work. So I was just wondering if you could touch on that for a little bit. Sure. Uh, Nate talked about it, too. You know, when in large CPGs, right, you have to remember what we're trying to do. We, we, we want to find something that we can repeat over and over and over again at scale. And in order to do that, it's large amounts of capital required. So therefore, our tolerance for risk goes down, right? It's an inverse correlation between uh, capital and risk, particularly in our, in, in our industry. So the collective, we, we spend a lot of time to, to try to make sure that we have nailed it, right? That way, when we invest... Uh, we have a high level of confidence that we, we can see a very positive return. And, and it is quite rigorous, right? I mean, you, you'll start with your consumer, typically in CPG, you're, you're anchoring yourself off what you do well as a strength, and you're, you're trying to bring those two together. You're searching for a job to be done is, is uh, a vernacular that we use uh, here at Smucker, and, and I did at Campbell's is Kelly, you mentioned it, like, what is the need? What's the marketplace need? And, and, and job language is very different than, you know, an opportunity. A job defines, um, you know, the classic, uh, I need a hole in the wall. Is that a drill or a hammer, right? And the job defines uh, what that is. So we spend a considerable amount of time, at, you know, in, in recent major launches for us, it'll be upwards of two years where you are refining and testing and refining uh, and testing. Um, I'll be the first to say we can overcook it <laughs> for sure. Uh, I also think the nature of consumer behavior nowadays and the availability of uh, witnessing consumer behavior in real time, you know, it used to be if you, if you sold something at Walmart, I could get the data a week later via empirical evidence in, in uh, databases. You know, if you have a Shopify account or an Amazon, you, you know the minute that purchase happened. And so uh, I think the CPG industry um, is on a journey to understand how we can still have the level of rigor that gives us the confidence that we're solving for very real consumer needs, but we can do it and do it at scale, but, but, but do it quicker and do it faster. So one of the things I want to jump to what Kelly said and talk about some of the challenges that we face, not only in CPG, but across the board. I think there's a real challenge around, again, solving the problem versus just having a solution that hasn't been identified yet. So I think that's one of them. I think we heard a little bit about timing being part of the issue as well. But Kelly, if you could sort of kick us off on what are some of the challenges or differences in CPG or frankly, opportunities um, for them to do better, that would be interesting to hear about. Sure. I just want to dig a little bit into solving the problem. I teach a class on commercializing new technology and we have a lot of on, you know, aspiring entrepreneurs in the class. And I see this a lot in the corporate environment, which is why I'm kind of using this story. Everyone has a preconceived notion of what it is they're doing. So they come into this class and they think, oh, I have an idea for this innovation, whatever it is. Um, and they're trying to figure out ways to fit this innovation into the marketplace. Um, they don't realize that the whole journey is about listening to your customers and finding early adopters and really like identifying that gap and then bringing in what the appropriate solution is. So it's almost like we approach innovation, especially in some of the bigger companies I work with, almost in the opposite way, right? We offer this. So here are the, th you know, the things that we could do. So I'm a big proponent of really thinking through, you know, turning it on its head and make sure you're solving that market need before you're offering what the solution is. I think the, that Ryan talked about one of the biggest challenges and that's kind of speed to market. Um, another one of our mantras in our class is done is better than perfect. 
I think um, a lot of people try and bake things to the point where it's certain. And while we all want an absolute certain return on our investment, the, the way the market is moving, especially with COVID, you know, sometimes you have to get out there and test and learn. So I'm also a big proponent of kind of starting small, piloting things, seeing what you can learn, and then tweaking. And um, finally, I guess I would say my last big uh, learning is follow the money. If you're experimenting and you think you're going down one path, but the money's leading you down another, then it's an opportunity to pivot and change and really follow the money. Yeah, great insights there. Um, Nate, I was wondering if you could add on to that. I, you and I have had some conversations offline about your experience at both Starbucks and Amazon. I'm sure you, you've got a pretty good view of sort of the pros and cons, strengths and weaknesses that you see. I wonder if you could share some of those with us. For me, I think Ryan hit it. It's overcooking, right? And it's that it's that 18 months. I'm a big 80 20 go go guy. Like, let's not waste time, right? And uh, you know, I think with 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 CPG, uh, you've got you know 15 different customers at a different time. First, you got to get through your boss. Then you got to get through you know, her boss. And then you got to get it through somebody else. And then you got to get it through the financial people. And then and, then, and now we're you know. <laughs> which deck am I making this for, right? Is it for my boss and the managers? Or is it for, you know, the sales guys to have a good conversation? Is it, you know, and, and, and then is it for, you know, Giant Eagle specific, right? I mean, too many cooks in the kitchen. Um, it takes way too long um, and it's frustrating, right? It's just modifying decks essentially, right? And you know, you've got a good proposition. The data proves it, space allows for it. So, you know, when you make a jump to, you know, someplace like a, a Starbucks, the conversation is a little bit different, right? People want to have conversations with you. I, mean, I, I remember at Heinz, it was, you know, well, we can't get on their calendar for three months, right? I mean, Starbucks is different, right? We, oh, will you, why don't you come in next week? Let's have a conversation about how you're doing, how you're touching customers, right? You, then you go to, so it got a little better, right? Then you go to Amazon and uh, it's just, a players and chiefs and who can get it done quicker. There was, you know, we'd find initiatives and projects of two work streams. And the only two people that knew were Jeff and somebody else and whoever got there quickest, um, whoever had the best ideas and it would merge at some point and go. So for me, uh, it's, it's the overcooking, it's the analysis, it's the, some of the rigor that has to go into it. I would say is necessary all the time, but I understand public companies versus private and some of those other things and considerations that, that are required. Um, since you're touching on it, one of the things I st started with was talking about customer and customer discovery. Somehow we always end up talking about some of the internal strifes and struggles of doing all work, including innovation. I would just wonder from all of you, your thoughts on how to build cultures of innovation, things you've seen or done that... Um, we could pass along and share with others that would you know, be a positive way and a positive learning about how we can make that aspect of it better, more efficient, smarter. If I was to start, I would say, I think Amazon had a leadership principle, which is, you know, learn and be curious, right? And you, you foster that curiosity in whatever manner that forms. So, you know, one of my bosses, uh, you know, would start and send out an email to everybody, and, you know, here's a thought starter, go, right? And, uh, and so I thought that was, you know, a great principle. And then to, to model it was just fantastic, right? Because, you know, once everybody could build on it, you could immediately go and do it. You had the data, you had the insights, uh, you just had to put together a paper, you know, two to three pages and, you know, you make a decision and you move. Nice when you have that option and that openness and flexibility. And I think having that that culture that allows for risk-taking and that culture that allows for open debate and dialogue is really important. Um, Kelly, Ryan, would either of you like to comment on culture of innovation? I've had the opportunity to build innovation teams uh, from the ground up, and I have certainly learned a ton about leadership because leadership of innovation is very different than leadership of call line management responsible for, for p &L. Kelly mentioned uh, T-shaped talent. Uh, I, I certainly agree with that. Talent is, is everything. Uh, I actually think it's an opportunity for the CPG industry. Uh, so much talent uh, these days uh, goes into the tech sector uh, and some of the others that um, and CPG, I think, has, has gone left, is wanting a bit. But uh, so I'm a huge believer in, in talent. Uh, T-shaped talent, I, I would add to T-shaped talent is 
folks that are okay with ambiguity. And by the way, it's okay to not be okay with ambiguity because you know, you know who you are, but if you are going to be a successful leader uh, or innovator, dare I say entrepreneurs, you're going to have to be comfortable with ambiguity and not knowing if there's a, a, a foothold on your next step, but trusting that there will be there. If you got to skip a little, if you got to make a longer jump, you know, that you'll get there. And so it, it starts with talent and what that talent looks like and then how you develop that talent. Um, I'd add the culture itself has to be one. Um, Nate said, you know, embrace curiosity. I think it's embrace failure as well, right? And, and those two things together, curiosity and failure. And, you know, it's probably cliche, but this idea of fail for, forward is like, what did you learn? What's that feedback loop that continues to be the wind behind you as opposed to the wind uh, in front of you? And I, I think that is really critical to an innovation culture. And as someone who has led it at the executive level is um, you've got to find champions, right? To ask one person or one team to be the bearer of, of the innovation culture is, is just, especially inside of a large matrix organization. So you need the support um, of very senior leaders who will very vocally and vocally and visibly have your back call out opportunities you know i make it a point it's like hey we did this thing in town halls where we this is excellent this was terrible and here's what we learned but it, you'd be surprised where i get the phone calls or ims afterwards and people are like i'm so thankful you said that you know that really means a lot it gives me the courage to to push on on this project where maybe i had some hesitation and so all those elements is, is is critical to how you foster that curiosity the creativity and then the wherewithal to like make the leap I think it's easy to say, have that culture of failure or have that be part of it. I can speak to my past experiences where that was the talk, but that was not the action that went with it. So I think that's a place where there is always room to evolve and do better and be better in calling it out, learning from it and moving on with it and letting it go at times for it. Kelly? I think everyone covered all the bases, honestly. <laughs> Okay, good. I'd like to turn it around a little bit now and talk about getting back more market facing on this. We heard in the earlier presentation talking about how COVID was affecting employees and that working relationship. I'd like to broaden that conversation to talk a little bit about consumer trends and what's driving our innovation of the future. So if we could just hear from all three of you on the trends that you see that are really affecting and impacting in a positive way to start um, your innovation efforts. It's no surprise that the pandemic has changed how consumers do two things, uh, absorb information, specifically through media, how they decipher it. And then two, um, in, in the case of consumables, which is what Nate and Kelly and I are talking about, is how they actually, how those consumables end up in their house. Right. And I happen to lead a category of pet food that changed dramatically through COVID. Pre COVID, uh, the pet industry was, was a top three in terms of e commerce sales. So it was already a strong player. We were at about 13%. Now we're at 30%. So in less than two years, it's more than doubled in terms of uh, amount of sales that happen on a, on a pure play site relative to a purchase uh, in store. That is a really dramatic change. Uh, in consumer behavior. Um, again, that, that happens to be one category. But when you when you put things on subscri subscription, uh, when you put things on the lists, I mean, all of us use uh, Amazon or GiantEagle.com or what have you, and, and you go in and you're, you're, the same shopping list was there from the last time you were there, there's not a lot of incentive to deviate. And that's a challenge for marketers and it's a challenge for innovators, right? It's like, even if, even if I've got, if I've solved and created value for a consumer, how, do, how can I bump into them with it? You know, typically it was linear television or I do an end cap at Giant Eagle or, right? Um, and, and that world has really changed. So consumers loyalty to specific brands has increased in the pandemic. Their breadth of SKUs that they actually purchase has shrunk. And so all of those things present a real challenge to, to innovators and marketers. I believe and we believe as a team that consumers are still seeking for brands that can add more value. And whether that's how I think about cleaning my bathroom or how it's thinking about uh, uh, preparing a Tuesday taco, like those needs are still there. But this, but how consumers are, are absorbing media and how they get it delivered to their house has really changed the, their aperture. And so we haven't figured it out yet, frankly. Um, and it's not just our challenge, but 
hopefully that was a start. Yeah, I'll add to that. I was involved in a pitch in the past couple of weeks from a really fastly growing CPG company. They're like, you know, conquering the world. They were raising some additional capital. And the CEO was talking about two trends that I thought were particularly relevant here. One is the increasing customer acquisition costs, especially with Facebook and privacy and how that's going to continue to grow. So the cost to acquire a customer for any, uh, especially new brand is, you know, it's skyrocketing. And the second thing is looking at omni-channel versus just DTC because of that. So, you know, whether that's a combination of wholesale, uh, bricks and mortar, uh, DTC partners, but becoming more omni-channel instead of just, you know, DTC are two things that I see really playing out. If I was going to add one to that, I'm a, I'm a creature of habit. You know, I'm brand loyal. Um, I go into the grocery store. I kind of know where I'm going to go, you know, over the, we haven't really been able to go to the grocery store, right? So if they, there's another one out there. It's called, you know, last mile and, and what that all looks like and, and, you know, how you're getting stuff into somebody's hand, but, you know, impacting efforts, uh, no one's strolling an aisle. I don't want to, to stroll down the aisle with someone next to me. I, I'm going in, I'm getting it and I'm, I'm moving out. So you talk about like, like, how are you supposed to find? Uh, those new products, those new innovations and whatnot. I think it's a lot harder today than it was, especially if you, you know, whether it's Amazon and their, you know, 15,000 different detail pages, trying to find something is is excruciating. So I think, you know, as marketers, we have a, we have a tough job to try to figure out how to elevate and show, uh, you know, the innovations uh, to the customers these days. And, and it's working with partners as, you know, Kelly mentioned the omnichannel approach and all those other things to try to make sure that that those things are, uh, that our innovations, you know, are being seen. Mm -hmm. Kelly, you brought up a good point talking about the omni-channel because one of the trends that we've seen and talked a lot about within the category are both that notion of D2C and e-commerce as two specific areas of it. And I think your point is valid and correct and that it's bigger and more than that. Um, but I wanted to pose the question, Ryan, to you specifically on the D2C piece of it, because I know that you are still working in the, the pet category. Um, and I know there's been a lot of new players in that space. So I thought you might be willing to share your thoughts on D2C and where that fits in the marketplace. Sure. You know, DTC, there's a lot of appeal for large brands DTC, right? Because it then becomes very one-to-one -one relationship. And there's no middle person that can try to squeak out some equity somewhere or, or, or value. In the pet food space, DTC has been uh, an emerging trend for sure. So this idea that I can get a personalized dog food and deliver it to my house is appealing, especially if you're going to give it at a price that's comparative to what I can get from a large retailer or what I can get from a, a, a pure play uh, platform. It is very appealing from a consumer perspective in that end. Consumers also don't want to have 19 different DTCs. I, I don't want one person. I have to manage a website for my shaving cream and for my razor and another one for my dog food and another one for my cleaning products. And then, so what, what you're starting to see is some aggregators right there where, where they do the curation for you, right? So, hey, if I'm interested in, in cleaning and maintenance supplies that are generally good for me, good for the environment, good for my family. Like there are sites out there where that, that can curate for you. And just speaking very frankly, and Melissa and I, you have talked about this and, and Nate at Amazon, I'm sure we could debate this for hours, but in, in no world are you ever going to make money shipping a 50 pound bag of dog food to someone's house. I, I, I stare at the P&Ls every day. I, I'm in the very fierce negotiations with Amazon every day. There, there's no world where that exists. So there's a rub up against providing consumer a service, but they're not yet paying for the value of that service. And I think the, the tape hasn't been, the record hasn't been fully pressed yet in terms of where does that start to level out for, from an absolute um, price value um, perspective. You know, many have tried from a DTC uh, to scale it. I, I think there are some folks out there that are learning their way through it. I've interviewed them. I, I've been part of pitches where they, they've shared. And I, there's some interesting things out there. I'm not quite sure it's been fully figured out yet. 
Yeah, and I think that links directly to another challenge with that area is what Kelly had mentioned too about the customer acquisition costs. Because although we've seen so many DTCs come to the marketplace, it's certainly one of the challenges that's universal across our board is getting those costs down. As we look at the future and we look at the work that's in front of us moving forward, what are some of the things that we should be keeping in mind, thinking about? It may be some of the opportunities we talked about earlier. It may be challenges like supply chain, ingredient sourcing. But you know, let's look at the next 18 months, say. What are the, the positives and negatives and challenges that you may have to deal with in that period? What's, what's on the horizon beyond CPG? I think workforce development and supply chain, I don't know that they're opportunities, they're more challenges with both. There's certainly opportunities too, but all of my clients are talking about those things. I mean, they just are having great challenges finding the people that they want to um, work there or be members or, you know, whatever their business model is. Workforce development is a big one and supply chain especially with a lot of the startups that I'm seeing, you know, when they have chips and components and things that are coming from a global supply chain that continues to like them. So I think they're all finding their way through that, but those are the two, I, two really big trends I see in the next 18 months continuing. Kelly nailed it. I'll uh, and add an, an opportunity or, or positive spin on it is while those challenges are going to exist, my encouragement to, to my team and my enterprise has been to look within I think it's an opportunity for us to innovate within. We're constantly looking at jobs to be done for our customers. We, we fail to look at the jobs that to be done inside of our own organizations. How do we fundamentally change as an organization? That can be how we do what we do, which is manufacture goods and services and get them to stores or people's houses. Or it can be, let's be innovative on how we are developing our talent, where we're asking our talent's creativity. And I, I've just tried to use it as a fire spark. You know, we, CPG has often talked about it, but I, I've just said, if there's ever a time it's, you know, steel is born out of uh, explosion and crisis, right? Like, so this is how we can really set ourselves up for the next five years. Supply chain is going to be there for 18 months, no doubt about it. But if we can make decisions and choices and fundamentally change our structure um, will be the beneficiaries five years from now. And, and we can expect our, our EPS to be better than our competition. I, I think now's the time to do it. Well, before I turn it over to Lou, I just want to give Kelly one more chance to promote her new book since it actually is being released this week. I'm sure people heard it in the beginning, but I wouldn't be doing justice to her work if I didn't let her give one more plug for her uh, new book as well. Oh, thank you, Melissa. So the book is A Way Back to Health, 12 Lessons from a Cancer Survivor. It's all over. It's available on Amazon. Um, in fact, it broke into the top 50 rankings in both the cancer and the midlife uh, books today in both the Kindle and the paperback version. So um, it looks like it's getting some good traction and hopefully that means it's helping some people out there. Thank you for the shameless uh, opportunity for the shameless plug. <laughs> always, always. We're all marketers at heart. Thanks to Nate and Ryan as well for their time today and their time outside of this forum and helping our students and talking about cases and, and just being great partners for both CMU and Tepper and the Schwartz Center. So I appreciate that much. Thanks for bringing us together, Melissa. My pleasure. Thanks, Melissa. And I'd like to thank Ryan, Nate, and Kelly, too. And Kelly, I was going to ask you to plug your book, too, but <laughs> Melissa beat me to it. So great, great stuff. Mm -hmm.